Hi, everybody. This is Sylvia Hepler, owner and president of Launching Lives LLC, which is a career development specialty company for executives and managers based in Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. And yes, I do serve clients all across the United States, which I'm very proud of. It's great to be back for video number four in this video mini series, which is directly linked to my 12 step blueprint or process blueprint for landing your next job. I'm really, really pleased about this system because it can reduce a great amount of struggle and disappointment for you as you look to land your next position, whether that's climbing the ladder right where you are, getting a promotion, or actually going elsewhere, working for another organization, another company, or in a whole new industry or field. How exciting is that? So in this video, number four, we are going to launch into one of the other steps in that 12-step blueprint. And in video three, we had looked at what do you really want in your next job and what don't you want in your next job. Both of those are equally important as I shared with you in the previous video filming. But today, we're going to take a look at this step called predict potential blocks to your success. And I deliberately chose the verb predict. Isn't that an interesting word to use? I could have just said, let's take a look at, let's identify, let's see what blocks may potentially exist to your success. But I chose the word predict because predict means Let's get with it. Let's get on the bandwagon. Let's be proactive here. And let's get a sense before we even get going what could serve as roadblocks between where you are right now, which is a place where I guess you don't necessarily want to be, and where you eventually want to get to, which we have to assume is a better place, a happier place, a more peaceful and fulfilling place than where you are currently. So it's really about predicting these blocks. And if we can predict these blocks early on, that means we have a much greater chance of proactively managing them. So with that said, let's just launch forward and let's take the plunge into a whole bunch of these potential blocks. And as you look at these, you may think, gosh, I never realized there's so many different kinds of blocks. This is probably a good time for me to share with you that there are both internal and external blocks. Internal meaning related directly to you. Related to you in terms of what's going on up in your head, what's going on in your psyche, what's going on in your heart, what's going on in that pit of your stomach when you get those butterflies, for example, you know, they're very telling. They're indicative of something. You need to pay attention. So there are these internal, unique to you, personal blocks. And there are external, meaning outside of yourself, blocks, such as other people, circumstances, and situations. Those are the external kind of blocks. And while I'm gonna share a variety of both, just to give you some ideas. I also want you to understand very proactively and forthrightly that the bulk of our potential blocks when it comes to our success, and especially our future success, have to do with what's going on inside of us. What's going on inside of our heads, our hearts, and our stomachs. Really critical stuff there, and I want to call your attention to it. So it all kinds of, kind of starts with what's going on with you inside, and then we can take a look at what's going on on the outside. So the first potential block I want to call your attention to is the excuses that you make. And you know what? We all make them. We all have excuses. Some of them are very germane to us as a unique individual. Others are more generic that you hear all over the place from lots of people. 
What do you tell yourself about time constraints and energy and distance and money and family members and oh, what's this person going to think and oh, what's that person going to think? I can't possibly do X because of Y. You see, those are examples of the kinds of excuses that we're constantly feeding through our brains all day long directly and indirectly. Sometimes we are aware of the excuse generating voice going on up here and other times it is so subtle and so silent that we are not consciously aware. But you know, I don't care if you're conscious of it or not, these excuses are circling around in the brain all day long and in my brain as well. So we need to kind of, you know, get our arms around what are the excuses that we're telling ourselves and then more importantly, once we've identified them, what are we going to do with those? How are we going to manage those excuses? How are we going to minimize their negative impact? And in some cases, how are we going to just obliterate them right off of our map, so to speak? Just get rid of them so that they evaporate, that they no longer exist in our life, in our world, to negatively impact the trajectory of our career. And then lack of confidence. You know, this is so huge to me. I probably should have drawn a red circle around the word confidence. The reason I say that is the longer I work with clients, the more I realize that the deepest, most basic reason why most people are stuck, stuck where they are, or stuck in terms of being able to move forward, is because they lack certain types of confidence. Now, when people lack confidence, it's, it's not usually that they lack all confidence. It's kind of hard to meet somebody who has like literally zero confidence or negative numbers confidence. It's very rare to meet someone like that. In fact, if you did, the person probably couldn't function in the world. So what I usually see among my clients is they will have confidence in certain areas, certain ways, and then they don't have enough confidence or any confidence in other areas or other ways. And you need to start looking at where are you leaking confidence? That's really what I call it, leaking confidence. What are your confidence leaks? Is it messages that other people are giving you? Is it past failures? Is it beliefs you hold like, oh, I can't possibly make a presentation in front of other people, I'm too scared? I could never do that. I don't have the confidence to do that, to stand up in front of people. Well, let me tell you, probably 25 years ago, I would have never had the confidence to make this video for you today. In fact, I'm almost certain that I wouldn't have had the confidence that it takes to make this video series for you. And time constraints. Time constraints can be a block. If you are not actually setting aside the time to take certain actions, time will become one of your big blocks. Now we all just get 24 seven. That's not rocket science. You know that, I know that. It's a fact of the world. It's a fact of life. It's a matter of how are you going to invest and spend your 24 seven and how am I going to do that? And each of us has different ideas about how we spend our time is going to look, how we're going to invest our time proactively. How is that going to look? It's all very individualized, but you know what? The bottom line message here about time is that how we use our time is a personal choice. Now, most of us think that's not true. Most of us think someone else is dictating how we're gonna spend our time and how we're gonna use our time, but that is really not the case. And if you say, well, I don't really get to choose how I use my time at this place of employment, I would still say to you, yes, you do. That is still a choice because you get to choose to leave that particular organization. You don't have to stay there if you don't like how you're spending and using your time while you work there. So make, make sure that you are not allowing time to become or maybe it already is, one of your major stumbling blocks. Because when it becomes a block, then what I hear from clients, frequently I hear this from clients, you know, Sylvia, I want another job. 
But the point is I don't have time to look for one. Well, what is that? What does that mean? You really, really want another job? You can feel it in the pit of your stomach? You're so miserable where you are, but now you're gonna tell me you don't have time to do a job search? You need to get real about that. And I know I don't mean to sound harsh. I'm probably sounding strident. But know that I'm saying that in a very loving way, underneath however my, my tone of voice sounds right now. I'm really actually being very loving with you, maybe in a tough love sort of way. You need to understand that this only goes so far, and you get to choose how you're going to use it for the good, for the bad, and for your own happiness and well-being. Now, fears are another big stumbling block, and every human being walking the planet has fears. It's a matter of what they are. You know, there is no one immune to fears. Most of us have several. If you can honestly think of only one, wow, you stand light years apart from just about all of the rest of humanity. Most of us have anywhere from three to five fears. And it might be something like, I'm afraid of heights. Well, you know, that probably isn't going to impact your career trajectory unless you're thinking about being an airplane pilot or the pilot of a helicopter, for example. Uh, those would be some uh, exceptional examples. But there are other fears that really will stand in your way. Fears of doing something different. Fears of taking risks. Fears of stepping out of this nice, neat little box you've carved out for yourself over the last 10 years or the last two years. Fears of marketing your skills in a fresh way that attracts new people's attention. You know, there's just all kinds of fears. Fears of losing money. I hear that from people. Oh my word, Sylvia, if I change jobs, I might not be able to make the dollars that I'm currently making. Right now I'm earning 100 grand. I'm afraid that if I get another job, they can only pay me 75 grand. You know, there's just so many different fears that human beings walk around with. And all of them constrict us and contract us and keep us small. What about your doubts? We're all walking around with those too. What do you doubt in this world? What do you doubt about you? What do you doubt about the economy and the employers and the state of the world and your future and your career and what you're able to do and the contributions you're able to make? What doubts do you harbor? What doubts are, are lingering in your head and circling around? And often fears and doubts kind of like are meshed together, they go together. You need to get clear about specifically what do you doubt. Case in point, if you doubt that you can ever get a better job than the one you have right now, trust me, you won't ever get a better job than the one you have now. It isn't going to happen because it goes back to your beliefs. If that's what you really, really believe in the depths of your soul and your stomach, that is the reality that you will in essence create over time. That will be true for you tomorrow and next week, next month, next year, and at the end of your formal career, it will also be true. Now that leads us beautifully and directly right into those good old beliefs and assumptions that we looked at in video number two. Remember how we had kind of dissected those in a lot of different categories? You really do need to get clarity around those and figure out how can you reframe those? We didn't talk about reframing in video number two, but let's just talk about that briefly right now. Think about a belief that you know in your heart is holding you back. Think about an assumption that you know is holding you back, preventing you from moving forward in the way that you wanna move. What do you need to do with that? How can you restate that in a way that can start working for you rather than working against you as an actual block that gets in your way and prevents you from moving forward in the ways that you say you want to move forward. So it's about reframing. Let's take one of those. Oh, the economy is so sluggish. Nobody is hiring. That's a belief that I hear everywhere I go and I hear it from clients as well. How could you reframe that in a way that's still rooted in reality? You know, we're not talking about Pollyanna here. That's still rooted in reality, but offers you some hope 
possibility and potential? Well, you could simply say, I realize that our economy is not growing as fast as I would like it to grow. So you're acknowledging the truth of the economy. But then you can take it to another and different level and say, I fully trust that despite the economy, there are employers hiring people with my skills, strengths, and passions. Do you hear the difference in the reframing? That's very different than constantly saying to yourself, nobody's hiring now in a sluggish economy. The reframing is going to serve you much more effectively than your original stymied belief and assumption. Now, a more externally focused potential block could be your life partner, your spouse or your partner, who is very much against you moving to another state to take the job of your dreams, who says, I need you home at five o'clock for dinner every night so that you can spend some time with the kids instead of working a job where you're walking in the door at 7 p.m. three to five nights a week. Those are examples where you may find you have a resistant partner and you're gonna to need to find ways to conversationally work through those areas and levels of his or her resistance. And you know what? This may get into some uncomfortable territory, but this, when you have these kinds of conversations, this is gonna kind of show you the strength of your relationship with that partner. Are you even able to broach these kinds of tricky, touchy, intimate conversations? Or does the other party just blow up as soon as you start talking about moving to California? You know, how do these conversations usually go in your house? Are you able to have them? And are you able to stop moving in like a circular argument mode and actually get to some sort of consensus or resolution? Is that possible? And if the answer is no, maybe it's time to actually reevaluate that partnership. That's a whole other video, by the way, a whole other topic. If the answer is yes or mostly yes, good for you. You should applaud your relationship and the people involved in that relationship because that tells me you will be able to reach a conclusion together about what kind of next job is not just right for you, but right for the relationship and perhaps the entire family of children are involved. Let's move on to another category. An outdated resume will in fact stand in your way. I see this week in and week out with clients. I can't tell you how many clients forward me their resume and an email attachment. They're very interested in moving on to the next level, the next job, the next industry. And the very first thing out of my mouth is, I'd really like to review your resume. Send that on over to me. When I take a look at that resume later in the day or that evening, I discover that here's a person who hasn't actually done a state-of-the-art resume for five years or 10 years or in some cases 25 years because they've worked at the same company that long. I discover a resume that just isn't going to cut it in the modern world. It will immediately be thrown in the trash or at least put on the maybe pile for a possible second look later. And then of course you know how that goes. People never really do look at it for that second look. So you need to make sure that you understand the components of a state-of-the-art current day 2013 resume. What has to go into that document? How does it need to be formatted? How does that need to be presented? What kind of word choice do you need to use? What's the relevance of keywords? What's the value of white space? You know, all of those kinds of things. And those are some things that I actually help clients to work through. And then related to that is your inability to market yourself. Now, the resume, let me say, is a subset of your entire marketing plan. It's just a piece of your whole marketing plan. So maybe I should have actually switched the order of those. But regardless, when you decide that you're going to embark on a job search, you really need to develop a mini plan for how you're going to go through that process. How are you gonna put yourself out in the world? 
What kinds of perceptions about you do you want other people to get about you? What do you want other people to see in you, to focus upon you, to understand about you, to find attractive about you? And interviews are part of your marketing plan, by the way. You need to prepare for them. I find a lot of clients are not ready for an interview setting either today. Maybe the last time they interviewed was five years ago, two years ago, 15 years ago. You know, even if the last time you interviewed was just two years ago, you think, well, that's not so bad. That's still somewhat current day. There have been changes in the interview process. What employers are looking for right now in 2013 as opposed to two years ago. There are distinct differences. You need to be conscious and cognizant of what those differences are. So your marketing ability is central, it's critical for how quickly you are going to land the next job, and not just any job, but the right job for you. Now another potential block is your failure to make a job search a priority. And that takes us back to what I said a few moments ago. So many people will say, I can't stand the job I'm currently in. I just need to get out of here. I'm burned out. I'm sick of it. I don't like my boss. I don't like my colleagues. I don't like the projects. Whatever the case is, and sometimes it's several of those all wrapped up into one. But whatever your scenario is, you can't then say, but Sylvia, I don't have time for a job search. Or my family has to come first. Or this or that has to come first. In other words, you're not willing to make the job search a major priority. And when we talked about priority, priorities in video number one, we had talked about work-related priorities and personal priorities. You know, we have priorities in both of those categories. All of us do. But regardless of what showed up in your list of priorities, personal and work-related at that time, when you did a little bit of homework after that video, suddenly now, if you are wedded to the fact that you really do need to get another job, suddenly now you need to put job search under your work-related list of priorities. It really can't be any other way. You know, sometimes we want our cake and eat it too, and there's times for that. Sometimes we really can have our cake and eat it too. But in this regard, it isn't going to happen. I need to say that to you very forthrightly. So you need to get out of the clouds and out of the fantasy world that you're dreaming up for yourself. Unless you make a job search a priority and probably your number one work-related priority, you are not going to land the next best position. It simply can't happen because you're not doing anything to make it happen. Now the next one, I put a blue asterisk in front of because I just think this is huge. This kind of like encapsulates everything that we're saying here. In order to get the next job, you need to develop some kind of a process. And of course, that's where my 12-step blueprint comes in just beautifully for somebody such as yourself. You don't have to dream up the plan because I've already done that work. I've already created a structured 12-step process for people to get a promotion or change industries entirely or at least change organizations or companies. I have created the plan. So this is one thing that you don't necessarily have to worry about because I've already done the work. All you need to do, if you'd like to, is say yes. Yes, I want to engage in that 12-step plan. I don't want to have to do all the thinking around the structure and the step-by-step -step process. I want Sylvia to do all that thinking for me and lead me through that process. And in fact, I will. I'm currently doing it with clients now. But the point is, whether you engage my blueprint for landing the next job or work with somebody else or you don't work with anybody else and you only work with yourself, the bottom line, folks, is you must have a plan in place and I would suggest that you put your plan in writing. Step one, two, three, four, establish time frames and actions around all of those steps. And then of course, this is related to what I just said about the plan. Sometimes people actually have a plan or a partial plan and they're working the plan 
and, and then they get stuck. Or then some other priority takes precedence. Or something else rises up out of the blue and distracts them, you know, whatever the case. And the next thing you know, they got off track. They're no longer following the plan. They have fallen down flat. And it could be weeks, months, or years go by before they say, gosh, whatever happened to my plan? I'm not working my plan. And I'm certainly not in the job of my dreams. So you absolutely need to follow the plan, whether you're working my plan or working your own plan that you've devised, you absolutely have to follow whatever plan is in place. Because unless you take the actions, you will not get the result, you see. Results always follow structured, right, appropriate actions. And then finally, lack of support. Now this is huge. Uh, you know, this is certainly last but not least. If you don't have support, from other people in your life who mean something to you, from your life partner, uh, maybe from a close friend, maybe from a parent, depending on your age, maybe from some community person who you admire, maybe a colleague, and maybe depending on the relationship with your current boss, maybe even your boss, if you don't have the support from people who matter to you in your world, you will probably not land your next job because none of us are islands. None of us are going this journey in life totally by ourselves. And if you think you are, you really are fooling yourself, that, that's kind of a form of self-delusion. Now, some of us play the delusion game periodically, and that's okay, but when we're playing it perpetually and it stands in our way, that's a huge problem. So make sure that you're lining up your human support system. It doesn't have to be 10 people. Maybe it's only two. But make sure that those two people are on board with what you want to do and they will support you through the entire process. All right, with that said, as you know, I always provide little assignments at the end of a video. And your assignment at the conclusion of video four is to identify your unique top three potential blocks to success and then how you will manage them. So the second part is really critical there too. It's not just a matter of writing down your potential blocks to success, but then it's a matter of going back and thinking deeply about each one of those potential blocks. How will you jump over it, move beyond it, walk around it, or go through it? How will you actually manage those potential blocks? You need to get the clarity around that, folks, or it isn't going to happen. All right, so when we get together then next week, we will be on the fifth and final video. I'm excited to see you again next week. Take care, everybody.